About 50 years ago, there was a great excitement among the Sioux Indians. They had received warning that the Ojibwe, their inveterate enemies, were preparing a strong war party to wipe them out in village at a time. This was why Whooping Crane, their best scout, and two other trusted men were sent as spies into the Ojibwe country to learn the hostile plans. They traveled secretly to the headwaters of the Mississippi, as far as the lake on which was the principal Ojibwe village. Hid the canoe inland, then arranged that each should go scouting alone, return the next night, and signal by a familiar woodland code. Whooping Crane had great success and learned all he needed. So at midnight, he came cautiously back to the place of meeting. For a time, he listened for signals. Then, getting none, he began with the first they had arranged. He gave the long call of the hoodow. After a brief wait, he got a reply. Exactly the same as he had given it. It might have been an owl responding. It certainly was not one of his friends, for that was not the right answer. So he silently glided off in the woods to wait. After an hour, he ventured back to the neighborhood of the canoe, and upon a slightly rising ground halted, and gave the squall of the sheep fox. In a little while, the response came. Just the same. It was not the reply he had hoped for. It might be a she-fox answering back to a she-fox. He doubted that very much. Then it was probably an enemy. And he judged it wisest to hasten away. All that night and the next day he hid in a hollow log. Then when midnight was near, he stole up to the neighborhood of the hidden canoe and listened long for a signal. Not hearing any, he gave one they had agreed on. The growling bark of the dog fox. Very soon he heard a reply. The very same. A dog fox answering to a dog fox? No, no. Very unlikely. And in any case, it was not the answer arranged with his friends. So he withdrew as silently and quickly as he could. At first, he was minded to give it up for that night. But on towards dawn he came and made one more attempt. He thought, as he listened, that he caught the faint far moan of the timberwood. So presently, groping his way to the shore of the lake, he gave the rolling call the saloon gives when the day is breaking. <laughs> and a voice replied with the same call. <laughs> now he was sure that it was all done by the enemy. They were aware that he was in the country and were trying to decoy him. So he fled silently and afar off, nor rested till he was miles away from the ambush. All day he kept peace and thought, Alas, my two brave boys have surely met their fate. Now I must return alone to Dakota with the bad news. Then he said, No, that is not what we agreed on. We said we would try to meet for three times before giving it up. So the next number... No so the next night, at the darkest hour, he came crawling, cat-like, toward the appointed place, crawling like a man that is going into the very jaws of death. For he knew now for certain that the Ojibwe were lying in wait for him, and that probably both his friends were killed. Each time he raised his foot and set it down, he wriggled his toe to clear the spot of dry twigs that might snap. Every branch that barred his way he crawled under or around. Not a sound he made. No lynx could have gone more softly. He was still far from the canoe and listening keenly when he heard the soft howl of the timber wolf. A wolf or a friend or a foe, which was it? After due awaiting, he gave the squalling bark of the sheep fox. And very soon his heart leaped for joy to hear. 
of the dog's fox. It might indeed have been a real fox, but it was also the right answer. And for the first time, a little comfort was his. But he softly withdrew and waited an hour before he came along the lake shore and called the common call of the hoodow. <laughs> And the answer that came was one to gladden his heart, nearly the long wail. That the owl so often gave. Maybe it was an owl, but it was the right response. Quite now he had got the reply that they had arranged, and hope rose again in his heart. But his scalp and life were at stake. He could take no heedless risk. He crawled along to a safe distance and waited till the first streak of dawn was in the sky. Then, by the shores of the lake, he gave the loon call. <laughs> he waited, but heard no reply, which was better than the wrong one. Then he raised his hand to his mouth, and through the cup palm, he howled the long, soft call of the timber wolf. <laughs> It was no wolf whose cry came back, but a raven in a distant pine with his morning croak. <coughs> and the raven laughed to himself, a little chuckle of joy. Three times the signal had been right, and hope was strong again in his breast. But there were big chances against him. He waited till his ears were greeted by the soft, sweet whistling of the white throated sparrow. Another right signal. He glided over to a huge pine near the hidden canoe. With the handle of his ready knife, he tapped on its trunk the ordinary tap, tap, tap of the early woodpecker. From behind the trunk, there then stepped out a dark figure and another. Then a familiar voice said, Oh, Kola, wash day, lily wash day. Hail, brother, all is well. And he stood once more with his friends. And learned, even as he had suspected, that the night before, and the night before that, the Ojibwe had been lying in wait for them, had discovered their trail, and had tried to decoy them into a trap. But realizing the failure of the decoy calls, he assumed that the scouts had fled safely out of the country, and so had abandoned the pursuit. Thus, the Hooping Crane and his friends were able to get the information they sought, save their own lives, and warn their people by knowing and using the voices of the woods at night. <laughs> <laughs>